where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. For much of the pandemic, the place we live and the people we live with has become our entire world. Almost one in three Americans lives in a doubled up household, that is with other adults who aren't their partner or college age child. Today where we live, we talk about sharing living spaces. Now cost is a big factor in housing arrangements, but living with roommates also has social implications too. Now we want to hear from you. Do you live with roommates or live in a multi-generational household? Join us 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at where we live. Last March, more than 81 million Ameri- adults lived in a shared household. That's according to Pew Research Center. Where We Live producer Carmen Baskoff is one of them. She sat down with her roommate, Luke, to talk about their living situation. You're you know, in your late 20s. I'm also in my late 20s. And we're both adults living with roommates. Why did you want to keep living with roommates as a young person? I think there are a couple of things that are are good about living with roommates. I mean, number one, of course, is just how more affordable it makes living. Splitting the cost of rent by three can just go such a long way. And I think also, like, the social part of it is a big thing for me, too. (laughs) Um, I think I'm definitely very introverted. I think if I was, like, left to my own devices living by myself, I would become a hermit and never interact with anyone. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like we're, like, we have a really fun household. I think so too. And I think, I think in the same way, I'm also, and maybe this is embarrassing to say on public radio, but I feel like living with other people encourages me to better life habits, like <laughs> tidiness and yeah. more regular meals and bedtime and outside time. And yeah, I, I feel like, especially over the past, like, you know, year and a half or so yeah. that we've been living together in the pandemic, like, I remember probably through just thinking about what it would be like to not have anyone that you're living with and not being able to actually have any physical contact. Yeah, I feel like it's really been a lifesaver this last year and a half. Um, Okay, well, Luke, sadly, we are going to be... No longer roommates. No longer roommates soon. No! (laughs) Um, But you're going to keep living in New Haven and you're moving to a new place and Mm -hmm. you were trying to think about like what type of housing situation you're going to be in. What did you end up deciding to do yeah so I'm, I'm moving into another apartment with other roommates um you know i think i feel like even in our social circle it does seem there's like a tr- transition when people either they find a like a long-term partner that they want to move in with or if they moved in with their parents but um my parents live out of state and although i am uh, happy to be seeing someone I, uh, we just weren't ready to move in yet and So the roommate situation just seemed like, okay, let's do this again. I mean, it's been such a good fit for the last two years, so. Well, I will miss very much being your roommate. Me too. You're listening to Where We Live. They sound like they're pretty good roommates. We all have good roommate stories and bad roommate stories. But today we're talking about shared households and the trends that we're seeing. Joining us uh, on Zoom right now is Kim Velsey. She's a reporter for New York Magazine's real estate and design website, Curbed. Kim, welcome to our show. Hi, thank you for having me. So in your real estate reporting, you cover the rental market in New York, especially uh, in this last year and a half. And so does that resonate with you when you heard Carmen and Luke talking about, you know, the factors that lead them to uh, living with other people? Yes, definitely. I think when um, I started talking to people at the beginning of the pandemic, um, many people were sort of worried about having, you know, people they didn't know coming into their spaces. Uh, But within a few months, uh, the thing that I was hearing most was that people were looking for companionship with their roommates. It was one of the few sorts of relationships that you could have that felt very normal. And, uh, you know, people, I even heard from people who were moving in from studio apartments to live together because they were so lonely during the pandemic. 
When we think about doubled up households, uh, both uh, Luke and Carmen mentioned that it does save them money, as I would think, especially in a place like New York City, but even smaller cities like New Haven and Stanford, Kim. Yes, I think that um, something it's very expensive to live alone and it also um, is their, their expenses and effort and time associated with making all of your own food and not sharing any domestic duties. Um, paying for internet or water or electricity bills all yourself is much more expensive. Uh, and there's also often in many cities like New York, there's not enough housing like studio apartments for single people, you know, a third of all households or single family house or single person households. And uh, the housing stock doesn't really reflect that. So I think aside from the fact that many people do like the companionship of living with roommates, um, you know, what we have in terms of housing doesn't really reflect the, the types of households that we have. And we're going to be talking more about that here on Where We Live. You can join us, too, if you want to talk about your living arrangement, especially in this last year and a half, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Kim, we heard from Sean Gio from the Partnership for Stronger Communities sharing that there was a, a recent report uh, from the National Low Income Housing Coalition that, that shows a Connecticut resident would have to work 91 hours a week to be able to afford a modest two-bedroom apartment. Um, yes, I think something that is interesting about there's been a lot of sort of conversation um, when we talk about co-living and the rise of co-living companies and people sort of opting into communal households. But the reality is that across the country, people who are lower income have been living in these types of households, not necessarily by choice, but by necessity. Uh, for a long time now, it's not necessarily the norm to be able to afford your own space. And you see a lot of um, people sharing spaces um, and multi-generational households in a lot of parts of the country um, and increasingly everywhere because housing prices are sort of out of control, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic. Uh, for so long, we've heard how expensive it is to live in New York City. But in the in the pandemic, what did you see in the rental market in terms of cost, Kim? Uh, well, I think at first it, it did. It came down and people were able to get some deals. Uh, I did hear from people who, you know, were able to make the move from Brooklyn to Manhattan or find better apartments or sort of move into a neighborhood that they'd long sort of you know, wanted to to take up residence in, but the, it was pretty short lived. Uh, and now prices are going back up. We've even heard about like bidding wars for rental apartments. So I think that there was like this sort of hope for some time uh, among renters in New York City that the pandemic sort of might make a lot of things possible that it hadn't before, but it seems like more than anything, we're going back to normal and the normal is Sort of unaffordable rents for many people. So when we're looking at a, a traditional studio apartment and then comparing that with, say, a larger setup with uh, multiple uh, apartments, uh, what happened with cost there, Kim? Um, during the pandemic, studio apartments were uh, sort of the best deal around because a lot of people didn't want to be living alone. Uh, you would see places, especially in Manhattan, especially in the, on the Upper East Side, where there's a lot of that type of housing stock for under 1500 a month, which is a good deal for New York. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, basically the that sort of is all shifting um, at this point, and there's not really many sort of good deals left to be found anymore. You're, Kim, you're hearing uh, Kim Velsey here on Where We Live, she's a reporter for New York Magazine's real estate and design website, Curbed, talking about the factors uh, that lead people to double up, to, to have uh, roommates. Uh, obviously, cost is a big factor. But in this pandemic, Kim, you touched on this earlier, just the, the social implications of not wanting to be alone and the benefits of having a roommate. Uh, yeah, I think that a lot of people, yes, definitely a lot of people have talked about wanting that experience. And I think part of what is difficult in a place like New York City, um, especially because we have such small apartments and even two and three bedroom apartments aren't often very large in terms of square feet, is that people don't always sort of know how to go about 
living with other people or finding roommates, or they can be concerned that it might be difficult um, as they get older. Even though people do want this experience, it isn't only about cost. I wanted to bring in another voice. Uh, Jennifer Malinsky is a senior research associate at the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. Uh, Jen, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So we, we've been focusing on uh, city living and uh, what uh, Kim and others have experienced uh, living in cities with roommates. But when we think about these trends in adults uh, having uh, in a shared household, they may or may not even be related to each other. Uh, what trends have you been paying attention to? Um, I think three, three main trends. One is this increase in multi-generational households where extended family are living together in the same, the same home. Um, it's typically, t- you know, at least two adult generations plus maybe the grandkids or grandparents raising grandkids. Um, we've seen a lot of increase in that. 20% of people in the United States are living in some kind of multi-generational household. Uh, But we've also seen this increase in intentional communities, such as co-living, in which a group of people are coming together to form a community. Typically, everyone has their own unit, their own house, but there's a lot of shared facilities and shared activity. Um, And then we do have the non-family households, the the roommates, as you say, and we haven't seen that, um, you know, the, the share of households hasn't varied too, too much, but we do see this getting a lot more attention. And especially among older adults, I think there's this interest in uh, living together for social reasons, for economic reasons, and also for mutual support and aid. Um, There's there's different models where young people, maybe a graduate student is living with an older adult and can provide some uh, chores and and tasks in, in, in exchange for reduced rent. I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Jen. Kim, you did a story about a woman in Maine. Uh, I think she was in her mid-60s, and she decided that one day she she wanted to to uh, fulfill a dream she had of living in the city. And so how did she go about finding a roommate? It wasn't a typical someone in her age group. Right. So she realized that um, she rented her house in Maine, and she had always wanted to move to New York. She realized she couldn't afford to live alone. And I think many of her family members and friends are sort of doubtful that she would have an easy time finding a roommate um, because of her age. But she went on the Steens project and she was able to find someone who she really connected with. Um, you know, they both sort of did their own thing a lot of the time in the apartment. Um, you know, they weren't spending every second together. Um, but she said she was pleasantly surprised by how receptive people who were in their 20s or 30s were to living with someone who was older than them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jen, when we were talking about trends earlier, you know, how much of, of what we're seeing in terms of shared household relates to the fact that Americans are getting married much later than they did 50 years ago? Yeah, I think that's right. The uh, when I look at multi generational households, that's the, the family living together in one in one home. Uh, we really saw it bottom out in the nineteen uh, eighty ish time period. So you know we have you know, long tradition um, of multi generational households, but it, it kind of uh, peaked and then and then declined into the late, latter half of the twentieth century. But since then, it's been it's been pulled up, and I think the marrying later, uh, more single parent households where the single parent could benefit from the help of of the older generation raising the children. Those two trends have been really important. Another one has been population diversity because um, Hispanic and Asian families are more likely to live multi generationally uh, because of cultural traditions or economic imperatives. So as the country has become more diverse and, and likely, you know, as, as we continue down in that direction, we'll see more multi-generational households. Um, and of course, economics, we saw a lot of multi-generational households form during the recession. But it's interesting because coming out of the recession, that growth has slowed, but it's still on an upward trajectory. We're still seeing more and more people um, of the same family deciding to live together. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens post pandemic. Um, if that changed the equation about where older people want to live or where our younger people um, hope their parents might might live in, in older age. Oh, we're talking about older Americans, Jen, you know, this question of them living longer and thinking about, you know, suitable housing for them. Uh, you know, the idea that, you know, 
as people age, like maybe assistant living isn't what they want, but they still want to be part of a community. And so does it spur the question for all of us about, you know, you know, how we live uh, with these multiple generations and not, you know, thinking that there's a particular type of housing that's right for them? Yeah, I, I, I very much agree. I think, um, you know, the fastest growing age group in this country is those 80 and over. And that's also the group that's most likely to live alone. Uh, so, you know, 57% of people over 80 live alone. So I think it's, you know, for some people that may be a choice and a preference. Um, for others, though, it may be something that they would prefer not to do. So I think it's really important that we have these options of, intentional communities or living with family or living with roommates. I, you know, I think um, it, it just, there's no one size fits all solution. Uh, so we need to support all of these options. Something else that's interesting before the pandemic, you know, we heard uh, from, you know, about older Americans and the idea that living alone is not good for their health and general well-being. And then we find out in a pandemic, it's not good for any of us, Jen. Right. Yeah, just, <laughs> just this idea about you know, what makes a community and the importance of companionship. Uh, uh, when you, Where you're located, are you seeing uh, towns and neighborhoods thinking about this uh, more thoughtfully? I definitely think isolation has become, and loneliness uh, have have become much more, um, well, the awareness of them has grown during the pandemic as we've all experienced it. And I I hope that that empathy that we, you know, that that our own experiences will um, allow us to continue to think about people who um, who have been living alone, you know, before the pandemic and, and may not have many choices. So, yes, I, do, I think there's a, a huge um, amount of programming out there that is designed to address isolation for people who are living alone or even people living in uh, senior housing who couldn't get out and about and mingle with their neighbors during the pandemic. Um, you know, and I, I hope that that filters into us supporting more housing opportunities for, for people, um, because a lot of these solutions we're talking about, you know, don't fit in a typical single family house. They might need a bigger house. They might need um, an apartment building or a campus like setting for these intentional communities, the co-living. So there's, you know, there's a lot that, that I think we can do to support the actual construction of the physical um, housing for people to live in, in these different ways. And how all that relates to, to zoning in local towns and cities. We're going to be talking about that coming up here on Where We Live. But my guest right now, Jennifer Molinsky, a senior research associate at the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard, and Kim Velsey. She's a reporter for New York Magazine's real estate and design website, Curbed. We'll continue talking right after the break, and we want to hear from you. You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. At one point or another, most of us have lived with roommates, but isn't there more to it than lowering housing costs? What has this last year and a half in a pandemic showed us about the benefits of shared living? Now, doubling up or living with people in a shared household has increased over the past 40 years. That information from Pew Research Center. We're talking about this with my guest today on Zoom, Kim Velsey, reporter for New York Magazine's real estate and design website, Curbed. She used to work for the Hartford Current back in the day. So nice to talk with you today, Kim. And Jennifer Malinsky is here, a senior research associate at the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. Uh, Jen, I wanted to go back to you because we touched on multi-generational communities in the the last uh, segment. But when we think about uh, doubled up households, uh, this idea that there's more than one adult, they they may not uh, be uh, related. um, But just the idea that more people are feeling comfortable and have a need uh, to have a shared um, household uh, with uh, more than one adult. Can you talk more about the people we're, we're talking about? Sure. I mean, among the older population, which is 65 and over, about a million people are living in these um, unrelated, you know, roommate situations, or, or maybe perhaps one is a homeowner and the other person is a boarder. Um, and that's been growing. Um, it was just, you know, it, it's a small percentage of the older population, it, It's, um, but it's one that I think we have to pay attention to. Um, so it's it's definitely been growing over the past couple of decades. And 
I think it really has a lot to do with the companionship. Um, we even I've read um, about people feeling an increased sense of safety having somebody else in the home. Um, so if something should happen, there's somebody there, and then that support, that mutual support. So I, you know, I think this is um, this is a trend that's occurring across um, racial and ethnic groups too, which is an interesting thing because there are such differences in, such, say, the multi generational households by race and ethnicity. And are we hearing or seeing that more parents are moving in with their adult children, Jen? Yeah, it, it goes both ways. So uh, sometimes the it's the uh, adult children moving into the parents' household. Other times it's the the older generation moving into the children's the adult children's household. So you know, and I think that the really the difference is the older the person gets, the more likely they're in their ch- child's house. But it breaks out both ways. When I moved to Connecticut, um, the first time we were looking to buy a home, there are a few places that uh, advertise we have in-law apartments, and I never actually <laughs> really heard of that before. Can you talk about uh, uh, the, that that type of uh, housing? The fact that you could have, uh, you know, a part of your home that may be for uh, your mom or dad that they still need some space, you know, from your rowdy family and your young kids. <laughs> Yeah, so sometimes they're called accessory dwelling units, sometimes they're called in-law apartments. Um, So this could be a suite or an apartment carved out within the main home, or it could be sort of a cottage-like thing that um, is in the backyard or the side yard um, where someone could live. Um, This is, I think this is a a really interesting uh, trend and we're seeing a lot more of it. We're seeing a lot of states uh, trying to facilitate the ability of homeowners to to do this kind of thing because it typically provides lower cost housing, but it also provides these options, these flexible options for families um, over the life cycle. So it could be that the in-law apartment is actually occupied by an adult child, you know, back from college, but not yet sort of out fully on their own. It could be for in-laws, it could be for a caregiver. So definitely something that we're watching that, um, that a lot of communities and states, as I said, are thinking about how to change zoning laws to facilitate these because they really are important on so many fronts. Uh, We should mention that in the last legislative session here in Connecticut, that accessory dwelling units or ADUs passed, and this requires towns to allow single family homeowners to convert parts of their dwellings or detached garages into Mm -hmm. so-called accessory dwelling units. But in Connecticut, you know, towns can still vote to opt out. I think that's interesting. This what we've seen is a tension in communities that, you know, don't want to move away from that single family neighborhood, Jen. Yes, that's right. I think there's always some concern about privacy, about additional cars, you know, about increased density, even if it's in this form, you know, even if it's in the form of there's actually no new building, it's part of the the existing structure. So I think those are issues that are common to a lot of um, moves to increase housing options, unfortunately. And it speaks to what people think of in the traditional sense of what is a nuclear family, right? Uh, that people should be blood relatives uh, versus uh, um, random adults living together. Right. That's a big issue. And, and I know you'll, you'll get to this later in the program, but that, that zoning often prohibits a number of unrelated people from living together. Uh, Kim Valsi, uh, you're still with us. Uh, I wanted to go back to you because we just mentioned briefly about co-living. You've written a lot about these trends. And how is that different from, you know, what we're seeing in traditional communities that, you know, have places where people can rent and have roommates? Right. Well, co-living became popular about a decade ago where you had a lot of companies who basically try to come in and do what people had been doing informally forever uh, with roommates. And they, um, you know, sort of basically package together the rooms with like other services like housekeeping and household supplies that are supposed to sort of take the tension out of the roommate relationship. And um, I think what was interesting in cities like New York was that these things were popular because there had long been a need for, you know, something like a boarding house or a rooming house for somebody who was moving to the city who didn't have any contacts or connections uh, could find a place and, you know, not get sort of scammed off Craigslist or, you know, not worry about their roommates being untrustworthy um, and find housing in that way. And 
you know, many of them were sort of less of the sort of utopian communal nature uh, and sort of more just of a, a very practical type of housing. And, you know, there are still a few um, types of uh, sort of women's boarding houses that are left in New York City from, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and it, I feel like in many ways, you know, these new co-living spaces sort of were offering the same service as those where, you know, it was you don't know anyone, um, you know, here's a safe way you can sort of move to New York City. That's interesting. Uh, Jen, you've looked at co-living outside cities. What have you found? Right. So I think there's there's also this form of co-living that is created by the actual residents. So people coming together to form this community um, where there, there may be some thing that ties people together, such as a, a desire to live in an eco-friendly way or a desire to have multi-generational or intergenerational uh, experiences. And so there's sort of a, a goal or a mission of the community. And we've definitely seen these picking up in the United States. There, there's a lot of models in Europe um, and, and they're of great interest to people who are studying aging because, you know, these are, um, uh, reaching out to a lot of older people who want to live on their own, but in community. So they, there's a little bit of both. It's interesting uh, when people hear about co-living or intentional communities, you know, they might have in their minds, you know, uh, back in, in the 60s, uh, no disrespect to anyone, but this idea of like of, of hippies living together. But now it's it, that 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 definition is changing. Well, yeah, I think they, the the um, the communities vary so much. We're doing some research now looking at multi-generational intentional communities in Germany where there's some public support for these things. And they're very different. The ones that we've seen, you know, the, the building is, is entirely different. One is in an old school, one is in, you know, a rehab department, one is in a completely slick modern new building. And so the feel of them are different. The, the things that draw people together are different. So I, I think, you know, you probably could find some that hark back to the 60s, but you'll you'll find a lot <laughs> that, um, you know, speak to other interests and other other kind of um, communities as well. Um, there's also an intentional community, I believe, in Western Mass uh, that uh, you could talk about. Could you tell us how that one works? Yeah, the, the treehouse uh, community is a really interesting one in which um, it, it was created to support families adopting children out of the foster care system. So the community is comprised of the families, uh, the kids, and older adults who live in their own apartments, um, usually uh, lower cost housing, but but they're there to provide support to those families. So it's it really is a village raising the kids. And there's a ton of community activities and people are really invested in each other's lives. So that's a really interesting one. There's also um, different uh, models of housing for grandparents raising grandchildren because the, you know, the needs of that population is, is a bit different and, and older adults you know, have certain needs as do kids. And so bringing together some supports for all those, um, all those people in one building is, is another trend we're seeing. Uh, we wanted to hear from our listeners about uh, shared uh, housing arrangements. Uh, Eliana is calling in. Eliana, what's been your experience? Eliana, can you hear us? I can now. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. So, what's been your experience with shared living? What's been your experience with shared living? Great. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, so, I I live in Washington D.C. and I've lived here for about eight years in um, in co-op cooperative living situations anywhere from four to 13 people. <laughs> um, and I actually recently just bought a house um, just this week, actually. And I'm looking to have a cooperative living situation there, me and my partner and a few other roommates. And um, I've, I'm just reflecting on my experience of actually trying to find a house um, for, for a number of uh, unrelated people. And we tried several times when we first moved into the house that we, per um, that we live in now, um, encountering landlords who were skeptical of a group of people who, um, who were unrelated. And even when I was um, looking to buy homeowner's insurance for my new house, um, I was told that I would need a different type of homeowner's insurance policy <laughs> if I were to have people living in the house who were not related to me. Um, and so my question is, um, I would love to hear folks reflect more on some of the barriers to 
um, I guess what, what people have called sort of non-traditional group living settings in cities and maybe some of the places that are looking to sort of dismantle those. Um, and yeah, I'm thinking about like mm. in a home, like we, we share a kitchen, we share a common space um, and we each have our own bedroom. But I know that there there's some places that really um, some of the systems are not really set up to to put up with that, I guess. So I would love to hear some reflections about that. Yes, and thank you, Eliana. It's actually a good transition because we wanted to bring up a case that happened in the West End of Hartford. Uh, Kim, you know about this. Uh, This was, a, as Eliana mentioned, a group of families, no one related uh, outside of the families, but they wanted to live together. And there were some issues within the city of Hartford um, where they were told that they couldn't do that. Um, Yes, I think that was a, it was a sort of fascinating case um, where they had, it was several families, I believe, who had bought, purchased the house together and it was a large house. Um, There was like certainly more than enough room for everyone who was living there, but they were challenged on the fact that they were unrelated people living together. Um, And I think one of the things that's complicated is that you know, often when you're sort of outside of cities, people, neighbors and um, town zonings, they they challenge, um, you know, people sharing a house. And then, you know, when you sort of go within cities, housing prices are often so expensive that people can't afford to, to do something like that. So in like New York, um, it would be very difficult to buy a townhouse uh, with, you know, several other families. Um, where it wouldn't be as you know challenging your neighbors wouldn't be as likely to complain but um it, it's definitely um difficult to set up these households i think and you know personally living in new york i've often i lived with roommates for years and i've wondered you know if there was any way to to find the situation like that again and it's it's very difficult i don't know how you would do it here uh, Eliana, uh, to add some more uh, info to this uh, this particular case in Hartford, uh, again, this was a 10-bedroom house, and these several couples with children wanted to live uh, in this house. They ended up going to court um, because they wanted to live together, and it was zoned for single family. Ultimately, the city dropped the case, and they're still living together. So there are examples of, of where this um, is permitted, even though it was a big fight. Uh, I wanted to go back uh, to you, Jen, Malinsky, because when we think about, you know, say New England, where we've got a lot of older housing stock, uh, some of these mansions where it makes sense that that one family can't really live in a a house like this. And why not have some flexibility where people can live within this house and not be beholden to these uh, these old zoning uh, codes? Right. That the there are often prohibitions against, you know, carving up an old house for apartments, uh, you know, that would violate certain aspects of zoning or building codes. So that's definitely something that I think we is, is a barrier we could, you know, think about removing. Um, it's also tough to access financing for some of these things, as Eliana may have experienced, you know, getting a mortgage, or if you want to build an accessory dwelling unit, you know, sometimes those aren't cheap. And you, but if it's not going to be an income producing property, you know, you could run into things with with, with um, trying to finance that. So I think what we're seeing on the positive side is um, efforts to, you know, recognition, first of all, that this is a growing phenomenon and people want to live together and we need to rethink these things. And then on things like ADUs, we're seeing some movement where uh, companies are trying to make it easier to build these things. There's prefab versions, there's, you know, different um experiments with financing. So I think we're getting there, but it's it's definitely kind of undoing the old way of thinking. And I wanted to end with you, uh, Jen Malinsky, because we've been talking about the trend of people doubling up or having uh, shared households. But when we think about the research you're doing, a lot of people still live alone and they may not, maybe speaks to the fact that we need to have more options for people. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the the biggest group, as I said, of older adults are those that live alone. And it's it's a big category across all age groups, for sure. So I, you know, I think, as I said before, uh, for many people, this is a preference, but for many, it may not be. And so I just think what we've been talking about here is um, housing that needs to be more flexible. We might need flexible floor plans or accessory dwelling units. We might need to think about those big old houses. Um, we might need to think about the kind of uh, land that an intentional community might need um, and, and how to place these things too so that 
a big thing for me is that they're part of a community. They're not sort of tucked away so that um, if we're building housing for, you know, older adults or an older adult community, that it's very connected to the community. So I think there's no, you know, there's no one size fits all in any of these, um, if any solutions. Uh, there's no one size fits all for older adults or for any age group. So we just need to think very broadly about housing options. Jennifer Malinsky, again, is Senior Research Associate at the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. Jen, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And it was good to hear from Kim Velsey, a former Hartford Current reporter, now reporting for New York Magazine's real estate and design website, Curbed. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. After the break, we're going to talk about how traditional zoning laws affect living arrangements. You can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. listening to where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. Joining us now on Zoom is Devin Michelle Bunton, Assistant Professor of Urban Economics and Housing at MIT. Devin, welcome to our show. Thank you. It's great to be here. So we've been talking about what leads people to share living spaces and the types of arrangements, but we've got to talk about housing. And so can you give us a little history of when single family zoning laws first started appearing? Yeah, so single family zoning laws uh, first started appearing, I think, in Berkeley, California in 1916 was the first sort of comprehensive uh, plan. And the way that these plans, uh, that these zones worked is that they took the whole city and they divided it uh, up into separate spaces where different types of uses were allowed. And on the one hand, we think of sort of industrial factories that should have their own zone. And it's hard to disagree with that uh, when, you know, they're spewing pollutants into the air. Uh, but there are also uh, separate residential zones uh, for apartments and then single family homes uh, zones. And the single family zones are uh, spaces where uh, you can only have one home per lot and you cannot build uh, even a duplex or, you know, in New England, a triple decker. You can't build anything like that. Just a single family zone. And before single family zones uh, really became popular, they're preceded by racial zoning laws, Devin? Yes, that's right. So uh, a little bit earlier, uh, 1911, the first uh, racial zoning laws came uh, into being in uh, places like Louisville, Baltimore, and a, a large number of other cities, mostly in the in the South, uh, had laws that in one way or another uh, declared that a particular block um, or part of the city was only available to black families uh, or only available to white families. And this, uh, I think, uh, shows the the sort of social control uh, pretty front and center that that zoning is really trying to uh, to implement. And those those explicitly racial racist zoning laws uh, were declared unconstitutional within a few years by the Supreme Court. Uh, and those cities uh, went back to their books and, in many cases, more or less just changed the labels on the map so that places that were uh, that were uh, white neighborhoods became single family zones and places that had been black neighborhoods became uh, multifamily or even commercial or industrial zones. Hmm. And then even looking back to city life, you know, more than a century ago, can you talk through some of what were common housing arrangements? I mean, people were living in hotels back then, right? Yeah, people were living in hotels and, uh, you know, there were a wide variety of, of ways of living at the time. And bef in the era before zoning laws, which really, you know, have this, this social control fees, there was there was a lot of uh, rapid change in cities and even within within particular homes. So you might have seen on the one hand a, a new some of these new mansions. Uh, like the one that the, the Scarborough 11 tried to move into um, that would have a family and then would later on have, have multiple families or maybe have borders. Uh, those single families would often have servants uh, living within them, especially in those sort of large mansions. And then on the other hand, you'd have uh, a large fraction of people living in uh, residential hotels, which are, you know, the, 
uh, sort of spaces where a lot of the, that have been making a comeback recently uh, in some ways, but there's a lot of the sort of everyday boarding uh, is taken care of. Uh, maybe there's a shared cafeteria or other meal opportunities and individuals have, you know, a room or, or uh, perhaps a couple of bedrooms uh, uh, of their own and just get to live in the city. And this, this at the time was a really big, uh, uh, evolution for the types of living arrangements that people could have in these growing urban areas uh, that enabled uh, women to have a place to live alone that was not with either their their parents or with their their spouse uh, and it enabled uh, a freedom there to pursue work to pursue different types of relationships um, and uh, they were viewed as a threat uh, especially after the era of zoning uh, these sorts of places were viewed as a threat. And it's not hard to see why when we look at the history. Uh, these ended up becoming spaces uh, where the anonymity of us renting a single room enabled uh, people to really explore different ways of living. And so these were some of the, the earliest uh, queer neighborhoods grew around these uh, because gay and lesbian couples were able to live together uh, and pose perhaps as roommates or at least have the have the ability to do so uh, and and queer life really started growing around these in places like Times Square in New York and Tower Town, uh, historic neighborhood sort of downtown Chicago. Hmm. Now you have written, you and your colleagues have written about the social implications of, of zoning rules on the LGBT community. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, this really comes down to understanding the single family zoning uh, says something about the type of house that's available to build on a space it's it's a, a, a house rather than you know an apartment building but it also says something about the type of family that's able to live in that house and so uh both of those are sort of baked into zoning laws and so uh a zoning law that says uh a single family also somewhere in that law is going to define what does a family mean and this is the uh, this is the law that, that uh, those families in, in uh, Hartford ran into, uh, where different cities and different states have taken different approaches over time, uh, but they have historically had the right to uh, define families not quite as restrictively as they might want to, um, but, but fairly restrictively. The one thing that they have not been able to do is they've not been able to ban non-traditional, non-normative blood families. So if a grandmother is raising her grandchildren, uh, that's allowed. Um, but today still, uh, two states, Michigan and Mississippi, have bans on straight couples living together if they're not married. And those are not really enforced, uh, but that's the kind of degree of control that they, that they allow. And so uh, if a state or city wants to, and many of them have historically, not recognized a queer family uh, as a family, they've, they've fully been able to do so and prevent uh, such couples from you know, trying to move in. So when we think about zoning laws defining who is or is not part of a family, are they more restrictive than, would you say, other parts of the legal system when they consider what a family is, Devin? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, so uh, in my own work, I have not researched this, but I have cited <laughs> uh, uh, the legal scholar Kate Redburn, whose, whose work on this is really fantastic. And in, in their work, they contrast uh, the functional family definition that's really common in family law. And in this, uh, in this version, um, of, of family definition, it doesn't, people don't have to be married. They don't have to have a blood relationship. They don't have to have a formal legal adoption. What they have to do is they have to show meaningful family commitments, the types of loving bonds that people are able to form in a variety of situations. And if they do show that, then they are entitled to all the obligations and the benefits that family law uh, provides to families. And one of the key things that, though, that that legal framework looks at is whether or not you live together. And so families are people who live together and, and are sort of intentionally creating a family. Unfortunately, zoning law is not nearly so uh, uh, friendly. Zoning law has stuck with the formal family definition where it's spelled out pretty specifically that things like uh, a family is 
uh, married couple living with children or other blood relatives. And so uh, many states across the country, many communities across the country have laws that say only two unrelated people can live together and maybe only three. And, you know, so many of us have broken these laws. I've broken these laws. I first got learning about housing policy in, in Boulder, Colorado, uh, when I lived with four people. Um, and two of them were dating and they shared a room, uh, but they weren't married yet. And so uh, we were living illegally at the time. I think that we had a cover story that me and uh, the other brunette were, were sisters, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, it never came up in the end, but it could have. It could have, and we would have, you know, been subject to eviction uh, because of the types of our relationship statuses. You mentioned earlier um, Kate's research, uh, the idea of a, a functional family versus a formal family. But before we uh, run out of time, when we talk about queerness, uh, the idea of chosen families or found families. Yeah, that's right. So I think that that. This is the, this issue of formal zoning is one that that cuts across a variety of, of different communities, and I think Kim and Jen have have detailed you know uh, some of the different uh, ways that this shows up for different different people with different commitments. Uh, for queer people and trans people, it's something that's particularly common uh, because we are much more common, uh, much more likely to end up having conflict with our uh, with our birth families, with our formal families. Uh, because many of them are not interested in, in loving us uh, the way that we are. And so uh, you see this show up in, in queer and teen youth who are much more likely to be homeless than straight youth. Um, and that sort of uh, family estrangement is, you know, continues to be common. And so uh, it's far more, far more, uh, not, maybe not far, far more likely, but definitely more likely that queer and trans people are going to be looking for those connections outside of formal families and are going to be uh, disproportionately affected by the types of laws that, you know, that prohibit or that make it difficult to, um, to use a functional family mm -hmm. as as your family um, in, in some neighborhoods in, in some cities. You know, Connecticut's often called the land of steady habits, but when we're thinking about zoning and the fact that, you know, a lot more, uh, there should be more different housing arrangements permitted, uh, Devin, do you see any movement, uh, uh, any models where um, neighborhoods or communities are, are uncoupling this definition of family from residential limits? Yeah, so there are, uh, I think, four states, uh, I think California and New York among them, maybe not Connecticut yet, though, California, New nope. York, New Jersey, <laughs> and, and Michigan, that have these, um, that have these uh, sorts of families are, by definition, brought into the fold, that, you know, if you're a single housekeeping unit, I think is the definition California uses, where uh, you know, the Scarborough 11 would certainly qualify. That's the whole point is to be able to live together, cook together, clean together, you know, have life together, uh, then, then you're allowed. And so the, there are uh, four states where that's explicitly allowed um, and they have not, they have not chose to ban it. And, you know, Connecticut in giving up the fight against the Scarborough 11 has, you know, hopefully uh, started to take a step down that direction. And I think that, you know, that Kate's work, they, uh, they really show how natural this evolution really is, that so much, uh, you know, so much of state and federal law is really about supporting um, these sorts of functional families. And so it's just hopefully a matter of time before zoning law comes along. We'll see here in Connecticut, but really interesting conversation with you, Devin Michelle Bunting, Assistant Professor of Urban Economics and Housing at MIT. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>